for those who don't know who we are, a lot of people would probably say that we're a geoscience company, and they're not totally wrong about that. We've done a lot of projects in a lot of places. But uh, I think that really, first and foremost, we're an HPC company. We're a, we're a technology company that happens to do geoscience. And really, where we, where we set ourselves apart, I think, from our peers is, is our focus on, on HPC and R&D. And what I'd like to talk about this morning is um, what we're doing just about 15 miles west of here, out in Katy, after a, a lengthy uh, search, which is ultimately aimed at the same reason that everybody else is here, right? Our business needs have, have exploded in terms of computational demand, right? Everybody we talk to wants to make models like this. Um, this is a, a 100, hertz, 100 hertz FWI from off the coast of Western Australia. And most people are probably aware that, that FWI is, is a frequency to the fourth power kind of problem, right? Um, this graph is showing on the y-axis uh, petaflops, single precision petaflops, and the curve is the amount of petaflops required to do 1,000 square Ks of sort of standard density seismic in 30 days. And we're pretty uh, comfortably able to do 60, 70 hertz at this point, but we just don't have the compute to do large scale uh, analyses like these, right, over large areas. So we, we had no choice. We have to build a new data center. Uh, and we're also trying to bring our HPC expertise to more external clients as a HPC as a service private cloud offering. And so for all these reasons, our existing four data centers, we're, we're not going to cut it. The other thing we're really excited about is we think that there's, a, there's an opportunity now to sort of change early stage exploration, right? Where we'd like to go almost straight off the boat into a result like we just showed. And to put some perspective on what that means in terms of compute power, for every shot that you acquire in maybe 10 seconds, and that's probably generous these days, it's more like five with uh, the dense shot carpets we're doing, we need about 30 hours of CPU time to do a really not that high, uh, not that super freely X FWI. That's like 50 hertz TTI acoustic. And so we need about 10,000 CPUs to keep up with the boat. If we want to deliver shortly after last shot, we need at least 10,000 CPUs for that very bare bones FWI. Then if you want elastic or you want 100 hertz, it explodes from there. So we decided to do what we hopefully do best and build this new data center out in Katy. Um, the blue part, just to, to put a, an idea around scale here, um, we're going to put 40,000 compute nodes in this blue area. We have the data hall next door that's the same size and ready for us to start building as soon as this one's finished. And then you can't see off the top of this diagram past the service yard is 10 acres of land that we have uh, architectural plans to build on that when these two are full. So by the time this is all said and done, uh, this, will, this should easily be a multi-exaflop uh, campus of, of compute centers. In this first room, though, what I'll talk about today, we're going to fit about 250 single precision petaflops in there. And this kind of scale created new challenges for us. This is a scale that we that we don't yet operate on. Um, this is about 15 megawatts, to put that in some perspective. And that kind of scale, it, it's, it's really, it, it's hard to appreciate until you actually go in the room, but this is incredibly dense, right? 15 megawatts in this space is about eight and a half kilowatts per square meter, or about um, 800 per square foot, 800 watts per square foot which our understanding is, is in the realm of three to four times what you would find in a, in a typical, uh, still fairly high density colo facility. So it's, it's very, very dense. And this saves us in all sorts of ways, right? Ob obvious ways include rent and, and raised flooring, but everything to do with the facility, whether it's plumbing or cabling and so on, all gets uh, less expensive the more dense we make it. Right? And we do this primarily uh, in the first instance through immersion, right? All of these little, little uh, blue rectangles are immersion tanks 
They're crammed very close together, right? We don't need hot aisles and cold aisles to manage airflow. We don't need to do complex uh, airflow analysis to keep the room cool. Every tank pretty much stands on its own. Certainly every row stands on its own. And it means that these aisles and these clearways are really almost minimum that code will let us get away with. Uh, the minimum amount that you can work in, that you can get machines in and out, get people in and out, that's the, the white space in the room. Um, the next thing that that allows us to do, though, is, I don't know what that was. The, uh, the machines don't have any fans. You don't need them, and indeed you don't want them. They'll just burn themselves out spinning in dielectric fluid. And somewhat to our surprise, when we took identical machines and ran the same workload in air and in fluid, taking the fans out saved us right off the top about 20%. Um, which stunned me that 20% that is going to just sort of completely useless uh, task of just moving air around uh, was, was a surprise. And then because we run this around 30 degrees Celsius, we don't need refrigerative cooling. Even in a place like Houston in the summertime where it's really hot and really humid, we can do it all with evaporation. So that's another 30% or so off the top of a typical colo. Um, Obviously, we didn't invent immersion. There's nothing, uh, you know, this has been done for 40 plus years. What I think we do very differently, though, is we made it very simple, as simple as we possibly could. We looked at, at every aspect. Um, you know, these tanks are really steel boxes. They're very simple. This is our sixth iteration of them, and every time we find ways to remove more elements so they're faster and cheaper to manufacture, they use less steel so they're cheaper to ship, and, and so on and so forth. Um, not, not every aspect of it, of course, is, is, comes for free. Um, we do have to fill this room with dielectric fluid. And to put that in some perspective, we needed 500,000 liters of dielectric fluid. And a KC-135 uh, aerial refueling tanker holds about 112,000 liters. So we would need to fill four of these with dielectric fluid to fill that first room. Uh, it's 500 IBCs worth turning up at the facility. But even with this, even with all that fluid, even with custom designed tanks and so on, um, all in, it is, it is cheaper than a, a sort of standard high-end water chilled door type rack. So it's, it's a very cost effective before you even start talking about density and those sorts of benefits. Um, the, the next big change that we made compared to a regular American data center, at any rate, has to do with voltage. This is a four megawatt transformer, and that is an OSHA-approved hard hat uh, that you can get. <laughs> That's Stuart, by the way. Um, very unlike one another. And in the United States, of course, it's, it's probably no surprise that most, not all, but most data centers run at 110 volts. And th this didn't really work for us. Um, it, it, for a variety of reasons, but the main one is you typically go through two transformations to get down to 110 volts. Um, from your, your medium voltage, 33 kilovolt, all the way down. And each one of those transforms costs you about 5%. And we were simply not willing to give up that 5% on a second transform. So we run at more typical Australian voltage, 240 volts, and we do it with a single transform. Um, we need four of those but, uh, to, uh, to, to fill the data center. But um, this was very non-standard. None of the Sparkies wanted to deal with it here. Uh, we had to work very closely with, with Skybox and with the utility um, to make this happen. But we were able to make it happen. And this flows all the way through the design, creating new efficiencies as we go. Right? Because it's 240 volt, we're obviously running at lower current. And this means that we can get away with fewer circuit boards, fewer cert breakers, fewer PDUs, fewer everything. Each one of these boards is a one megawatt panel board. It operates an entire row of tanks. And we run 70 amp three phase all the way to the tank, which means we just get away with, with about half as many of these as we would otherwise have. We were even able to reuse this otherwise dead space. Uh, in a room this size, we had to have these posts. It was, it was just to hold the ceiling up. And by being able to fit a minimum number of panel boards uh, in this otherwise dead space, we can fit an extra tank in every row. That's an extra 2.5% uh, worth of gear that we can fit in this room. The, 
The next thing downstream from that, of course, are the PDUs. So we custom designed PDUs that would run uh, at, at the voltages and amperages we wanted. We've got 72 plugs on here. And again, it just means that we can have way fewer of these. We custom designed them so they fit directly between the tanks, that they sit on these rails in between the tanks. And those rails serve the purpose of both reinforcing the tank, uh, but also providing space for this, this PDU. Then downstream from the PDU, of course, we have the power supplies themselves. And if you look at the uh, gold, platinum, titanium, whatever they're called, um, power supply ratings, you'll find that in every case for every workload, somewhere between two and 4% more efficient to run them at 240 volts than 110 volts. And most of the time, things like this aren't captured in PUE, right? People tend not to capture uh, losses due to transforms and losses due to power supply overheads, but they're very real and we pay for them all the same. So we, we try and look at every aspect, the, the whole power supply buffalo, um, if you will. The next part of power and sourcing it and, and using it as efficiently as possible is where we ended up building this data center. After a massive worldwide search, we settled eight miles west of our office in Katy. And this, this uh, rectangle is where room number one is inside Skybox. That's the Skybox facility. And then this rectangle is one of Houston's largest power substations. It's a 400 megawatt substation. Um, it's got dual feeds from north and south, and we get the power directly via underground conduit over to the building. So for a whole variety of, of reasons, right, this is obviously much lower transmission overhead. And you can say, well, you know, we don't pay for that. And in a sense, we don't. But in a sense, of course, we all pay for it eventually. Um, but also much more robust. We have years of data for the Skybox facility and the uh, supply of power and the, the voltage drops and so on that they've experienced over the course of several years. And being so close to the facility, right, there are very few opportunities for somebody to crash a car into a power pole and affect our power supply, right, or for lightning strikes and so on. Being this close to a, a facility that also has so much headroom, there's more than 100 megawatts of available capacity in that uh, substation. It was just upgraded a few years back. It means that we have all kinds of room to grow here and, uh, and have very stable, inexpensive power. The last thing I want to talk about before they throw me out is what I think is one of the more interesting and exciting choices for us. We've used 10 gigabit ethernet historically throughout all our data centers. Um, very standard, simple network um, from uh, Extreme at times and Penguin at other times. But we went a different direction with this new facility working very closely with Mellanox. And because the machines that we're uh, for the most part, installing our four nodes in a single 2RU chassis. We're deploying a multi-host network adapter where there's an actual NIC in uh, node number one and then three daughter boards in the three other nodes that are connected via external PCI connections. And this gave us a whole bunch of benefits, some of them really obvious, like we only have one external connection coming into every chassis, so we have a quarter as many cables uh, for the data network in the facility, which means we're saving 30,000 cables. Um, we're also uh, able to get 200 nodes then on a single switch. And we've totally collapsed by about half the total number of switches in the entire room, not just the leaf switches, but all the way up through the spines uh, as a result of that. But it also gives us some, some things that we, we weren't necessarily expecting, but are very welcome. For example, the uh, the standard networks we operate, right, they're all 10 gigabit, and every node stands on its own, so they, they can peak at 10 gigabit. This is a single 50 gigabit connection coming into the node, and any node on its own can burst up to 30 gigabits, and of course, if they all run flat out together, they can do 12 and a half each. Um, but especially within this four node chassis, uh, we get very low latency and extremely high bandwidths, which we can take advantage of in the applications. Right. The, uh, the other thing worth emphasizing is that none of that bridging in the master node goes through the OS. That's all handled by the card. So we're not adding any extra load to that master node. And indeed, the master node doesn't even have to be on. 
uh, as long as it's plugged into the chassis, it gets the power that it needs to, uh, to, to power that master node and do the bridging. So it's, we haven't created any new uh, single points of failure in that chassis by having this, this uh, single uh, NIC. So overall, um, like I said, you know, my, my time's almost up. It, it was by definition, it had to be a really high level overview, but I'm happy to talk in more detail about some of the things we're doing in this data center. We like to talk about PUE, and it's, it's an interesting number that's sort of easy to measure, and people know how to relate to it. But I also think it's important to just point out that it's, it's number one, it doesn't catch a lot of things that people might not typically think of in terms of overheads, like transmission overheads and like transformation overheads or fans and these types of things. But we also, unlike uh, some of the facilities I've worked at in the past, we, our budgets aren't all chopped up, right? It's not, the, the building isn't somebody else's problem and the labor is not somebody else's problem. I have to look at the entire cost of the entire facility. And so we're looking not just at the cost of power, but the capital investment and labor and so on. And by having fewer components, it just means less maintenance, fewer things that can fail, uh, and ultimately, hopefully, a, a more robust data center. Um, so I think I have two Earth minutes left for questions, if there are any. Uh, okay, so PUE, in theory, 1.0 is the, the ideal. So it's 100% of the, of the compute power is being used for useful work. Um, and the higher the number, this represents sort of excess power on lighting, on cooling, on everything that's not uh, uh, actually running computers. Yes? What have you done to mitigate the effects of flooding that's inherent in the area where you built? Indeed. We, <laughs> this is a good question about flooding. We, uh, that was certainly one of the criteria, especially looking in Houston. Um, Skybox is very well cited for that. There was certainly no flooding during Harvey. Um, it's, it's in an, a part of Houston that uh, has fared very well historically. So yes, we're, we're very aware of this. Anything else? Yes, sir. So this is with respect to the KMLs? Yes. The, the 40,000 nodes that I mentioned are uh, almost all entirely Knight's Landing Xeon 5s. Um, we're happy to put in whatever applications demand, especially as more third-party clients start using Doug as, a, as their uh, geoscience cloud. So we'll put in whatever we have to. But uh, we've, we've been, I think, the largest commercial user of KNLs for, for some years. And so that code modernization was done some time ago. Um, first for the KNC and then for the KNL, and, and just like the previous presenter mentioned, uh, we got great benefits on those codes running on classic Xeons as well. It's, it's all the same sort of code modernization. Um, you know, use, use all the threads, vectorize well, take advantage of high bandwidth memory. If you do that, the KNLs will run really well. I think time's up. Thank you.